All right, we're good to go. We're good to go. Good morning, family. Good morning. Good morning. I, I missed you last week. Um, I was up at, uh, at Hemlock with our young people. We had a retreat. There was 17 of us. It was fantastic, and it was really good, and I'll do some sharing about that later. But I, I have to tell you, after hanging out with that many sweaty teenagers, it is nice to be back with you. Uh, but it, it was a wonderful time. And uh, one of the things we did while we were up there is we wrote a song together based on the Bible studies we did while we were up there. And later on, we're going to sing that for you and teach it to you. And it's a beautiful song. Let's begin, though, with this reading from John chapter 4, verse 23. And if you could read it with me, that would be great. John chapter 4, verse 23. But the hour is coming and is now here when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. For the Father is seeking such people to worship him. May we be those people this morning. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, as we sing to you, as we sing together to you, we want to glorify you. And we know, Father, that our words are empty if they are not words that are backed with a life of love and kindness and generosity. And so we pray, Father, for forgiveness where we have failed this week and for great joy where we have succeeded in following you. And we pray, Father, that our worship would be beautiful to you and that we would carry on our worship, Father, in our lives and in our relationships. But thank you, Father, for this beautiful, symbolic, powerful act of singing that we can participate in now. We pray this in your name. Amen. This is a beautiful summoning song written by, written by Matt Redman. The sun comes up, it's a new Oh, uh -huh. I'm in the wrong key, my bad. I thought so. Sorry, guys. <laughs> the sun comes up, it's a new day dawning. It's time to sing your song. Save that thou art 
Thou my best thought by day or by night, waking or sleeping, thy presence my life. Be thou my wisdom and thou my true word, I ever with thee and thou with me, Lord. Thou my great Father, and I thy true Son. Thou in me dwelling, and I with thee one. Riches I heed not, O man's empty praise. Thou mine inheritance now and always. Thou and thou only first in my heart. I, King of heaven, I treasure thou art. I, King of heaven, my victory won. May I reach heaven's joys, O oh, bright heaven's sun. Heart of my own heart, Be my vision, O oh, ruler, of heart of my own heart, heart of my own heart, whatever befall, still be my vision, O oh, ruler of all. Proverbs 2, 1 to 3. Proverbs chapter 2, verses 1 to 3. Let's read this together. My son, if you receive my words and treasure up my commandments with you, making your ear attentive to wisdom and inclining your heart to understanding, yes, if you call out for insight and raise your voice for understanding, if you seek it like silver and search for it as for hidden treasures, then you will understand the fear of the Lord and find the knowledge of God. Who breaks the power of sin and darkness? Whose love is mighty and so much stronger? The King of glory, the King above all kings. Who shakes the whole earth with holy thunder? Who leaves us breathless in awe and wonder? The King of glory, the King above all kings. This is amazing grace. This is unfailing love that you would take my place. That you would bear my cross You would lay down your life That I would be set free Oh, Jesus, I sing for All that you've done for me Wow chaos back into order who makes the orphan a son and daughter the king of glory the king above all kings who rules the nations with truth and justice shines like the sun in all of its brilliance the king of Glory, the King above all kings. This is amazing grace. This is unfailing love. That you would take my place. That you would bear my cross. You would lay down your 
life that I would be set free. Oh, Jesus, I sing for all that you've done for me. Let's read together Deuteronomy 29, verse 29. The secret things belong to the Lord our God, but the things that are revealed belong to us and to our children forever, that we may do all the words of this law. If you will see with my eyes, if you will see with my eyes, if you will hear with my ears, if you will hear with my ears, then you will speak with my voice, then you will speak with my voice, then when I laugh you will rejoice, then when I laugh you will rejoice, then you and I. Brothers and sisters, you have your bulletins. It's in the marigold color.
or no, goldenrod. That's what it is. It's in the goldenrod color. And you can see everything that's happening, obviously, the order of service on the first page, what's happening this next week on the inside. Um, and you see there's uh, things like the congregational meeting coming up on Tuesday, July 19th. There's information about various staff and people who are away on vacation. And, of course, there's also information about prayer requests. So we want to pay special attention to those. And there's also one for, for me in there, my great aunt, my dad's aunt. She passed away. And uh, these three ladies were pretty amazing. They were three unmarried sisters. And they lived together their whole life, a school teacher and a nurse. And, and uh, these three um, ladies, they were just wonderful aunts to my dad and to me. And so, yeah, we want to say thank you. Uh, I mean, we, we want to, I, I want to remember them, and I'm just asking for prayer for my family. Um, I want to say thank you, and this is, I was getting to the next thing, I want to say thank you. In case you haven't noticed, we have a lot less tripping hazards here. Uh, you might notice that we had all these bubbles and ripples in the carpet. And uh, I remember once actually using that as an illustration for, like, the waters of the sea. And I'm so glad that I can no longer use that illustration. It's all been cleared up. We had some volunteers come in, and they worked very hard to take care of that, so thank you to that. We also had volunteers this, this weekend come out and completely rake out. It took about 30 man hours to rake out and clean up the volleyball pit that's outside to get everything ready for summer mode. We had volunteers come out um, and a pressure wash out to the courtyard area. And uh, I think there was like 20 buckets, big buckets. Was it 20? It was 17. Thank you. It was 17 buckets filled with almost fish smelling dirt. I, it smelled like when my, my grandpa used to take me fishing and we would clean the, the fish by the dock. That's what it smelled like. And they cleaned it all off. So again, that's just people who uh, believe that God wants them to use everything that they've been given for his glory. And they look for how they can help their local church here at Windsor and Marshall. And so these are volunteers from the different churches that all gather here, including this one. And we're all working together to do beautiful things for God. And there is vision in that. I think the future requires us to find the people who love God and to hold on to them very closely, regardless of what uh, maybe church denomination or background they came from. So let's continue to look for the true worshipers of God who truly want to worship him and, uh, and find blessing again and again in that. So a big thank you to all those volunteers. And of course, I'm confident every one of them would say, well, I, I did it for him. So we want to give glory to God. Glory to God. Um, you can see all the information is in here. There's also information about the uh, World Conference that's been happening in Indonesia. That's there as well. And um, we had some earlier announcements. But other than that, is there any announcements or things we want to draw attention to? Okay. Um, there is also, uh, nope, that's it for that. Good. Uh, let's shift gears here and let's get ready to head into our message this morning. And if you have your Bibles along, that would be good because uh, on one of the passages, I didn't put it up on the screen because we do want to encourage people to bring their Bibles still. It's still a good thing to do. And if you have your Bible on your phone, please resist the urge to play Candy Crush or check your emails as we are doing the actual uh, service and studying it. Yeah, I know, I know. No, it's an important skill set. Let's take a moment and let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for today, and we thank you for what you're doing, and we pray that you would calm our hearts. My, my heart, Father, is beating very fast today for some reason. I pray for peace and calm, and as we head into your word, Father, uh, help us to um, understand your truth so we can apply your truth and be a people who worship you in spirit and in truth. That is our desire. Um, we pray this in your beautiful name. Amen. Uh, the title of the sermon today is What We Learned in Hemlock. So in order to understand what we learned in Hemlock, uh, you need to know what I think many of you already know is that we have a weekly discipleship group that meets here. Now, we made a decision about two years ago that we wanted to move away from having a youth group, and a youth group then is, is anybody can come, and it's mostly focused on fun and games and relationship, and that just tends to be how things work out, and we wanted to do something more focused. So we called our thing Discipleship Group. And we, we expected that when people came, we would unapologetically do Bible study together and unapologetically do worship together. And we would do fun and games and other things like that, but we wanted to make sure that the tone was very much so set on making disciples because we see that there's many places for young people to go and relationally connect. The world is filled with those, but we wanted to create a place where people could come who wanted to grow and grow. And it's been wonderful working with these 15 to 20 people and, and we, we kind of commit to a year at a time, and we, we study together all kinds of things. And some of those things have inspired sermons on Sunday mornings. So, you know, we've kind of all journeyed together in that sense. 
And so we came to our year-end retreat, and we wanted to focus on some specific things. And I remember praying, God, what do we want to go back and review? What is it that we want to, to do to sum up? And we came up with uh, four points, four important points. And I want to walk through each of them, and there's a passage that goes with each one of them. And as we were doing this, because our group is quite creative, like there's like a rush to who will play the drums and who will play which instruments when we come together, we decided one of the best ways for us to reflect on how we would apply this would be to write verses to a song and kind of create a piece of art together and to learn that together. So we would do the Bible study, and then afterwards, together, we would write, um, write verses together, and we knew how many beats it had to be and what needed to rhyme and stuff like that. And it was a really, really exciting experience. And we did it together for like 10 minutes, and then we let everybody go who wanted to go have some free time, and anybody who wanted to stay could come and polish it up, and there was usually five or six people that really wanted to do that. And that led to a lot of really fantastic conversations. So... Here are, here's what we studied. Here's what we learned up at Hemlock, and it shaped what we're doing today. So first of all, I will need you in your Bibles to turn to Deuteronomy chapter 29. Deuteronomy chapter 29, we read the last verse of it a little earlier, which talks about the mysteries of God, the secret things. But uh, chapter 29 is interesting because chapter 29 is about people who know better. People who have learned about what God expects of us, and then they reject it. And you might think, this is a very strange passage to read with a group of young people. It's very difficult. It's very hard. But we wanted to start here because it's so important, because it talks about our responsibility. So let's read together from uh, chapter 29, verse 1. So I'll read it in my Bible. Please follow along in your Bible. I'm reading in the NIV, uh, the old one from 86. So if any of you are, are thrown off by the lack of inclusive language, sorry. But let's read together from Deuteronomy chapter 29. These are the terms of the covenant the Lord commanded Moses to make with the Israelites in Moab, in addition to the covenant he had made with them at Horeb. Moses summoned all the Israelites and said to them, Your eyes have seen all that the Lord did in Egypt to Pharaoh, to all his officials and to all his land. With your own eyes you saw those great trials, those miraculous signs and great wonders. But to this day the Lord has not given you a mind that understands or eyes that see, or ears that hear. During the 40 years that I led you through the desert, your clothes did not wear out, nor did the sandals on your feet. You ate no bread and drank no wine or other fermented drink. I did this so that you might know that I am the Lord your God. When you reached this place, Sion, king of Heshbon, and Og, king of Bashan, came out to fight against us, but we defeated them. We took their land and gave it as an inheritance to the Reubenites, the Gadites, and the half-tribe of Manasseh. Carefully follow the terms of this covenant so that you may prosper in everything you do. All of you are standing today in the presence of the Lord your God, your leaders and chief men, your elders and officials, and all the other men of Israel, together with your children and your wives and the aliens living in your camps who chop your wood and carry your water. So just, just a quick time out here. Everybody is there. The covenant is for everybody. Okay? You are standing here in order to enter into a covenant with the Lord your God, a covenant the Lord is making with you this day and sealing with an oath to confirm you this day as his people, that he may be your God as he promised you and as he swore to your fathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. I am making this covenant with its oath, not only with you who are standing here with us today in the presence of the Lord our God, but also with those who are not here today. In other words, future generations. You yourselves know how we lived in Egypt and how we passed through the countries on the way here. You saw among them their detestable images and idols of wood and stone, of silver and gold. Now make sure there is no man or woman, clan or tribe among you today whose heart turns away from the Lord our God to go and worship the gods of those nations. Make sure there is no root among you that produces such bitter poison. When such a person hears the words of this oath, he invokes a blessing on himself and therefore thinks I will be safe even though I persist in doing my own way. But this will bring disaster on the watered land as well as the dry. The Lord will never be willing to forgive him. His wrath and zeal will burn against that man. All the curses written in this book will fall upon him, and the Lord will blot out his name from under heaven. 
The Lord will single him out from all the tribes of Israel for disaster, according to all the curses of the covenant written in this book of the law. Your children will follow you in later generations, and foreigners who come from distant lands will see the calamities that have fallen on the land and, on, and the diseases with which the Lord has afflicted it. The whole land will be a burning waste of salt and sulfur. Nothing planted, nothing sprouting, no vegetation growing on it. It will be like the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah, Admon and Zeboim, which the Lord overthrew in his fierce anger. All the nations will ask, why has the Lord done this to this land? Why this fierce, burning anger? And the answer will be, it is because this people abandoned the covenant of the Lord, the God of their fathers, the covenant he made with them when he brought them out of Egypt. They went off and worshipped other gods and bowed down to them, gods they did not know, gods he had not given them. Therefore the Lord's anger burned against this land, so that he brought on it all the curses written in this book. In furious anger and in great wrath, the Lord uprooted them from their land and thrust them into another land as it is now. The secret things belong to the Lord our God, but the things revealed belong to us and to our children forever, that we may follow all the words of this law. That last verse reads a little different, doesn't it? Now that we read the entire chapter. We see that rejecting the covenant of God has enormous negative consequences. And I was talking with our young people about this. Imagine a group of 10 to 16-year-olds, right? There are, some of them are a little bit younger, some of them a bit older. And, of course, we have leaders who are in their 20s. And we're sitting there and we're reading through this. And it seems so long and so heavy. But after a while, as you're reading it, you start to understand that there really are consequences for rejecting God. There really are consequences for being lukewarm. And you know where those consequences come from? They come from God. God creates consequences. And God doesn't like it, but he is willing to use us as a negative example for what happens when you reject God. And does this not explain what is happening now in our post-Christendom society? We have an entire nations and countries firmly rejecting God, and so it only makes sense then that there would be serious consequences that would befall on individuals and on groups who reject God, that everyone may look and say, oh, look what happens when you reject the word of God as the basis for the laws of the land. Rejecting the word of God as the basis for right and wrong. The word of God is the basis for who you are and what you should do. When we reject God and his covenant and his instructions, there are horrible consequences. Now, as, as naturally self-centered people, that seems unfair. I should just be forgiven, right? God should take it easy on me. After all, am I not his favorite child? And this is the thought that is buried somewhere deep in our minds, that each of us is God's favorite child, and he'll take it easy on us for some reason. But here we read, rather bluntly, that God has made every human being who he loves the same offer of salvation, and that we get to decide if we will say yes to it or no. And if we say yes to it, and then we reject it in our lives, we can expect God to make an example of us. And so I just wanted to review something that I talked all the way through the year with this group. This is a serious decision to follow Jesus. Do not make it lightly. Do not say, I want to follow Jesus because your friends are saying it, because you will individually be held accountable for this. So we need to faithfully keep the covenant that has been handed down to us, we need to learn from the examples of those who came before us, and we need to be grateful that the covenant finds its perfect expression in a relationship with Jesus, so that we're not confused, because the covenant it is referring to here is the Old Testament covenant, which includes the, the law for the Jewish people. So we have a new covenant that is built on the foundation of this one. And the, the beautiful thing about that is, is that it's a little bit like a sandwich. Jesus, who sums up the new covenant, was also actually the foundation for the old covenant because he always was. God has always desired to have a relationship with us. And we broke it. And he is making a way back for us if we want it. But woe to the man, woman, or child who says yes to God 
and then thinks, oh, the promises of God are mine, and then they reject Jesus over and over and over again in their choices and in their words. They say, I do not know you, Jesus, in the way that they live every day, although when they, you know, are praying for, um, or, 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 or they, they um, comfort themselves with the words, Jesus has forgiven me, and then they pretend they don't know him the rest of the time. So, so do you see why it's so important for young people to understand this? It's so important for young people to understand their decisions do actually matter. Because our society actually works very hard to get rid of the consequences for bad choices. It's actually weird watching governments take on the responsibility to get rid of the negative consequences of bad choices. And yet we see that a lot of the time. I make a bad choice. Government, make me feel good about my choice. Society, help me somehow not deal with the consequences of my choice. We see it in so many areas and ways. And that's not God's way. So, the first thing that we talked about is, is that a relationship with God is a serious one, and you get to choose it. So we went to Deuteronomy 29 to talk about that. And then this is the verse that we wrote. Let's put it up on the screen, please. This is the, the, what, what we wrote. Oh, thank you. There we go. Perfect. This is the first verse we wrote. Forged in words, shaped by grace, a remnant always in this place. Looking back our path we trace, we will follow you. And the verse goes on to say this. Next slide, please. The covenant was handed down, received by saints now in the ground, and now we too are heaven bound. We will follow you. So those are the words that we wrote. And then we came to our second point. And the second point we found in Matthew chapter 5, verse 3 to 10. And, uh, and I, if you want to follow along in your Bibles again, Matthew chapter 5, 3 to 10, you can, but if not, I'm going to read. It's the Beatitudes, right? So here is Jesus speaking. He says, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. So we went through each of these, and we actually said, what does this mean? And it was wonderful. So much of the time, their, their, their instincts and what they had learned really prepared them to understand what we were talking about. And sometimes we had to work at it a little bit, like what does the word meek mean? We don't use that a lot. But here was some of the summaries, and I put them up on the screen. The Beatitudes reveal a completely different idea of winner and loser than what society has. What Jesus told us is blessed is definitely not what society has told us is blessed. Society says, grab power any way you can. Exercise power any way you can. And if you have a relationship with someone and it isn't benefiting you, cut them off. Those people are dead weight. And I wish it was not like that. I wish that our instincts for kindness were a little bit better, but the reality is, is that society usually only talks about kindness when it's some form of power, self-empowerment again, right? Like, if you want to be liked, be kind. Well, even then, being kind, that's the wrong motive for it, right? So here's, that's one idea. And that's why the second observation is so clear. The kingdom of God is truly foolish to the world. Guys, there were so many people who could not understand the things that Jesus said. The things he said did not make sense. And it was not just secular people. It was Jewish people who'd grown up in the law their whole life. And it was experts of the law who had studied God's revelation up to that point their entire life. And they thought what Jesus had to say was foolish. Even they had bought into the idea that you follow the law to gain power over other people, to be better than other people. And that's a real problem. So here's the verse that we wrote to go with this. A life that's blessed in heaven's eyes, rejected in a world of lies, life's true victors in disguise, we will follow you. Actually, could you guys read that with me together? Let's do this. A life that's blessed in heaven's eyes, rejected in a world of lies, life's true victors in disguise, we will follow you. Then we moved on to 1 John chapter 2, verse 1 to 11. My dear children, I write this to you so that you will not sin. 
But if anybody does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous one. He is the atoning sacrifice for our sins, and not only for ours, but also for the sins of the whole world. We know that we have come to know him if we keep his commands. Whoever says, I know him, but does not do what he commands is a liar, and the truth is not in that person. But if anyone obeys his word, love for God is truly made complete in them. This is how we know we are in him. Whoever claims to live in him must live as Jesus did. So, dear friends, I am not writing you a new command, but an old one, which you have heard since the beginning. This old command is the message you have heard. Yet, I am writing you a new command. Its truth is seen in him and in you, because the darkness is passing and the true light is already shining. Anyone who claims to be in the light, but hates a brother or sister is still in the darkness. Anyone who loves their brother and sister lives in the light and there is nothing in them to make them stumble. But anyone who hates a brother or sister is in the darkness and walks around in the darkness. They do not know where they are going because the darkness has blinded them. It's the word of God from 1 John chapter 2, verse 1 to 11. So, we wanted to think about what is this passage saying. So here we go. We must accept that Jesus is the only one who can save us. He is the only way. We are saved by knowing him, and we know that we know him by our obedience to him. And some are deceived about knowing him, and sadly, they don't. Sadly, they don't know him. And so, here's what we wrote in response to this. Acknowledging the lethal sin, the antidote that's found in him, forgiveness sought, forgiveness given, we will follow you. So let's read this together. Acknowledging the lethal sin, the antidote that's found in him, forgiveness sought, forgiveness given, we will follow you. And uh, we were going to write an entire other verse just about the last part, which would be something about, so we got to love each other. We got to love each other. We got to love each other. But what we decided to do is we decided to save that for the, the bridge, which is at the end, and you'll see it in a little bit. So we didn't, we didn't forget that part of what we just read, that if we love, if we say we know him, then we have to love one another. We're going to get to that. But let's first of all move on to 1 John 3, 16 to 18. And by the way, you should know a bunch of them got very excited when I said this because they're like, I know John 3, 16. And I'm like, no, it's 1 John 3, 16. And one of them looks at me dead in the eye and says, there's two of them? Why? Here we go. 1 John 3, 16 to 18. This is how we know what love is. Jesus Christ laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for our brothers and sisters. If anyone has material possessions and sees a brother or sister in need but has no pity on them, how can the love of God be in that person? Dear children, Let us not love with words or speech, but with actions and in truth. So we reflected on this, and we saw that loving God means obeying God. That's very straightforward. And that obeying God always includes loving one another. You cannot love the Father and hate his sons and daughters. It just doesn't actually work. It's a package deal. And then we saw rather specifically that loving one another means noticing and caring about each other's needs. It's very practical love. Love is beautiful. Sometimes in sonnets and poems and big over-the-top gifts, those things are not bad. But how sad it would be if someone loved in that way and they did not notice the everyday physical and emotional and mental needs that a person has, right? Like, how crazy is that? Can you imagine giving a bouquet of flowers to a starving person? Like just, just, just think about that. Like they might try to eat the flowers because their need for that is so much greater than have something that's pretty, you know, on, you know, on their table. So what we wrote then coming up to this was a love that satisfies all needs, displaying Jesus in our deeds, the sun that shines on planted seeds, we will follow you. And I'm sure you guys note in the third line that sun is spelled S-O-N, and that is not a typo, right? The sun that shines on planted seeds. So if you'll read this with me. A love that satisfies all needs, 
displaying Jesus in our deeds, the sun that shines on planted seeds, we will follow you. And then we wanted to get really practical, so we wrote this bridge. We will roll up our sleeves and work things out together. You led the 12 to do the same. Men and women called by you, a house built for forever, bound together in your name. Please read with me. We will roll up our sleeves and work things out together. You led the 12 to do the same. Men and women called by you, a house built for forever, bound together in your name. And that was our application point. We went through those four passages, and we talked about what it means to be a disciple. And we just keep asking the question again and again. You've made a decision to follow Jesus. You understand it a little better now. Your answer is still yes. Because if your answer is still yes, then you've got to take this and do something with it. And brothers and sisters, that's my challenge for you, and of course for me this morning. You guys know I have to do the work during the week in my own heart before I can come here. Otherwise, this, this box is just a box. The pulpit is a sacred space because we take seriously God's word. So I want you to know, this, this is hard for me this week, thinking these things through, praying through these things. And I want to encourage you to do the same. We, we, we have inherited a beautiful faith. And we can reject it, even as we pretend to hold on to it. But that would be a mistake. And God does not have a problem making an example of us if we do that. We know that what Jesus did was everything that needs to happen. He truly has paid the price for our sins, but we need to say yes to him. And if we know him, we will obey him. And if we obey him, we will love one another. And if we love one another, we will not ignore each other's deeds. It's a straight line, guys. It's a straight line with these points on it, but the trajectory is very, very clear. This is what it means to follow Jesus. So, I want to ask the worship team to come on up, and I want to invite you to sing this song with me that we worked on up at Hemlock. Forged in words and shaped by grace, a remnant always in this place. Looking back a path we trace, we will follow you. The covenant was handed down, received by saints now in the ground. And now we too are heaven bound. We will follow you. You are the leader, the truth and the way. We will follow you. By fire and night, by cloud and day, we will follow you. A life that's blessed in heaven's eyes, rejected in our world of lies. Life's true victors in disguise, we will follow you. Acknowledging the lethal sin, the antidote that's found in him. Forgiveness sought, forgiveness given, we will follow you. You are the leader, the truth and the way. Follow you by fire and night, by cloud and day. We will follow you. A light that satisfies all needs, displaying Jesus in our deeds. The sun that shines on planted seeds. We will follow you. You are the leader truth and the way, we will follow you, by fire and night, by cloud 
cloud and day, we will follow you. And here's that bridge. We will roll up our sleeves and work things out together. Whoa, whoa, whoa. You led the twelve to do the same. Men and women called by you, a house built for forever. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Bound together in your name. You are the leader, the truth and the way. We will follow you. By fire and night, by cloud and day, we will follow. Sing it again. You are the leader, the truth and the way. We will follow you. By fire and night, by cloud and day. We will follow you. Amen. Brothers and sisters, it's only been 45 minutes, but that is the lesson, and that is the music, and I hope that it will bless you, and uh, we'll post the words on our website, and we'll continue to learn this song together. But more than that, let us go out and do this. If we've read it, and we've studied it, and we understand it, now we must apply this. And praying that God will help us to see in our own lives practically what that looks like is so important. So let's do that right now. Heavenly Father, your word is very clear, although sometimes we are slow to understand. But what you have said in these four passages, Father, it, it charts our course in life. And now as we look at our week, our schedules and the things that are planned and unplanned, we pray, Father, that you would reveal to us how to love you by loving our brothers and sisters by meeting their needs we pray that you give us opportunities that we would clearly see as opportunities and father for those of us who need help help us to receive it for those of us who have suffered silently father please um, inform your saints of our needs and bring them to us that we may accept that help maybe even asking for that help Father, we want to know you better, and we know we cannot know you better if we don't love one another well. Show each of us what we need to do. We pray this in your name. Amen. We're going to uh, sing through the song again because it's a new song, and you're welcome to stay or you're welcome to go, but if you'd like to hear the song one more time, we're going to do it. Um, is your cable in the right place? Yes, sir. What? Is your cable? Forged in words and shaped by grace, a remnant always in this place. Looking back our path we trace, we will follow you. The covenant was handed down, received by saints now in the ground. And now we to our heaven bound, we will follow you. You are the leader, the truth and the way, we will follow you. By fire and night, by cloud and day, we will follow you. A life that's blessed in heaven's eyes, rejected in a world of lies. Life's true victors in disguise, we will follow you. Acknowledging the lethal sin, the antidote that's found in him. Forgiveness sought, forgiveness given, we will follow you. You are the leader, the truth and the way, we will follow you. By fire and night, by cloud and day, we will follow you. Satisfies all needs, displaying Jesus in our deeds. The sun that shines on planted seeds, we will follow you. You are the leader, the truth.
truth and the way we will follow you by fire and night by cloud and day we will follow you we will roll up our sleeves and work things out together whoa 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 you led the twelve to do the same by you, a house built for forever, whoa, 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 bound together in your name. Well, you are the leader, the truth and the way, we will follow you. By fire and night, by cloud and day, we will follow you. You are the leader, the truth and the way. Out in day, we will follow you. Brothers and sisters, go in peace.